Welcome back to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. Last week, Robin and I began a conversation about forgiveness uh, by talking about what forgiveness is not, what it's not. Sadly, too many Christians have this sense that if I'm still hurt by what such and such a person did, then I must not have forgiven them. If I still think about the event, I must have unforgiveness in my heart. If you have been taught that forgiveness somehow requires that you forget that the harmful event ever happened, then hopefully last week's episode disillusioned you of that notion. In today's show, I want to consider the question, what is our calling with regard to forgiving those who have harmed us? If forgiveness doesn't require forgetting, what does it require? How do I know if I've forgiven someone for harming me? And let me just say this at the outset. The Bible's treatment of the subject of forgiveness is far more nuanced and complex than many people acknowledge. So that's where we're going to go today. Thanks so much for listening. First off, I want to take just a few minutes to follow up on last week's subject of forgive and forget. If there is still some lingering doubt about maybe we really are called to forgive and forget. Uh, Just consider Jesus for a minute. Jesus is immensely forgiving. However, he knows nothing of forgive and forget. Consider the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. It's in Luke 22. Uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest friends. There's a sense in which you just have to pause and let that sink in. What would it be like for you if one of your closest friends betrayed you? Uh, Sadly, I know that for many of you, this is not a hypothetical question. You have experienced it, and Jesus experienced it. In Luke 22, we read that Peter was questioned three times by people who knew he was associated with Jesus. And after after Peter says, I don't know him, I don't know this Jesus, verse 60 to 61 says... And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Do you not sense the intensity of this look? I'm not saying it was an unkind look. The eyes Peter saw were immensely kind, but this couldn't be further from forgive and forget. In fact, this look that Jesus gave Peter actually tells us quite a bit about what forgiveness is. It's not forgive and forget, it's forgive and redeem. So put this thought on hold for a minute because we're going to return to it. But first, I want to identify the core elements of forgiveness. There's no way to tackle the whole subject of forgiveness in one one or two podcast episodes, but I want to begin by just naming some of the core elements of forgiveness. What does it mean to forgive? Number one, naming the harm that was done. You cannot forgive what you have not named as harmful and wrong. Now, I'm not saying that you need to tell the person who harmed you what they did. Please don't. Not yet. I'm talking about naming the harm that was done, just naming it to yourself, just admitting it to yourself. This first element is about you and you. It's not about having a conversation with the person who hurt you. I often hear the following two sentences back to back from people. And here are the two sentences. I've forgiven my father. He did the best he could. I've forgiven my mother. She did the best she could. Now, look, those two sentences can't both be true. If your father did the best he could, you have nothing to forgive. If you've forgiven your father then he had to do something to need forgiveness. You don't forgive someone for doing the best that they could. So the first step in the process of forgiveness is really confession. By this, I mean that in order to forgive another person, first you must confess what happened. The Greek word that is translated confess in the New Testament is the word homo legeo, Homo meaning sameness and legeo meaning speaking. So to confess is to speak sameness with God about what is true, about what actually happened. To confess is to speak sameness, homo legeo, with God about what is true. Saying the same thing as God. This is the opposite of denial. 
you have to say the same thing as God, known not only about the ways you've harmed others, your sin, that's how we typically think of confession, and that's part of confession. But another part of confession is to say the same thing as God about the ways others have done harm to you. If you refuse to confess the ways that others have harmed you, then you are living in denial just as much as if you refuse to confess your own sin. We go to great lengths to avoid truthfully acknowledging how our hearts have been wounded. I mean, many of us would rather spend a week in jail than truly acknowledge the nature of how specifically we have been harmed, especially by those closest to us. We minimize our wounds. We ignore them. We say things to our heart like, love covers over a multitude of sins. I mean, the excuses are legion. You can't forgive until you've named the harm. And the harm is almost always much worse than you think. So the first part of forgiveness is naming the harm that was done. But please hear the next two words with particularity. Naming the harm that was done with particularity. You have to be specific. It's impossible to forgive your father for hurting you. It's impossible. Why? Because hurting you is so abstract that it's meaningless and it becomes a form of denial. You can only forgive particular things, particular transgressions, particular moments. You can forgive your father for getting drunk the day you graduated from high school and missing your graduation, but you cannot forgive your father for hurting you. You can forgive your father for making comments about your developing body as you sat on the stairs in a beautiful dress waiting for your boyfriend to pick you up for prom, but you can't forgive your father for hurting you. You can forgive him for leaving his stack of pornographic movies in a place where you would find them as a 12-year-old, but you can't forgive him for hurting you. We can't forgive another until we admit with specificity how they have hurt us. God models this throughout the Old Testament when he repeatedly and relentlessly and thoroughly names how much he has been hurt by Israel. And we also see the necessity of naming the harm that was done in the story of Joseph. The the story of Joseph, uh, which is uh, in Genesis chapters 37 to 50, it's the longest and the most detailed account or story of forgiveness and reconciliation in the Bible. It spans 13 chapters. And in Genesis 45, smack dab in the middle of it, when Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers, do you know how he does it? This is what he says. Okay, he, this is Joseph revealing himself. If you don't know the story, read Genesis 37 to 50. It's, it's a fabulous narrative. And Joseph is revealing his identity to his brothers who have tried to kill him. And this is what he says. He says, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. The one you sold into Egypt. Come on, Joseph. Why are you still so bitter? It's been years since they've betrayed you. Why haven't you forgiven them? It looks like you've been harboring a root of bitterness all this time in Egypt. What about forgive and forget, Joseph? Why are you throwing their sin back in their face? What about grace, Joseph? Now, to be clear, Joseph is not launching into a tirade or recounting a litany of his brother's mistreatment of him, but he is identifying himself to his brothers who have kept a secret And he is identifying himself with particularity as the one that they sold into Egypt. Now, if you are interested in pursuing the process of forgiveness and reconciliation with someone who has hurt you, you can follow Joseph's footsteps. The first step is to name yourself well, the way Joseph names himself well. I'm not suggesting you speak it aloud to the person who hurt you, like Joseph did. It took time before Joseph did this. I'm just asking, can you name it to yourself? Can you name yourself to yourself? Can you say, I am your cousin, the one you sexually abused. I am your son, 
the one you neglected so you could work all the time. I am your daughter, the one you made sexually suggestive comments about. Can you do that? Can you name the truth unflinchingly? Again, unlike Joseph, I'm not suggesting that you say any of this to the person who has harmed you. That's a different podcast completely. How to engage others with the hope of reconciliation is another matter. Joseph is very gracious to his brothers, but he does not shrink back from naming the harm that was done to him. Many people today consider this blaming others, but there is a difference between blaming and naming. Indeed, the narrative structure, by which I mean the sequence of events, and sequence is very important in Hebrew narrative, which is to say in the Old Testament, the the narrative structure, the sequence of, of events, suggests that you cannot forgive until you have named Forgiveness and reconciliation, they come in Genesis 50, but there first must be a naming of harm. So that's the first component of the process of forgiveness, naming what has occurred. Element number two, the process of forgiveness requires a remembering not only of how the other has harmed us, but a remembering of the gracious welcome and embrace of God in the midst of how we are presently doing harm to others. So forgiveness is about not only remembering how others have harmed us, but it is a remembering of how we have done harm to others and God has welcomed and embraced us in the midst of our sin. The motivation for forgiveness cannot be obligation God is no more interested in obligation than he is in oppressing the poor. The motivation for forgiveness is a remembering of the reconciliation between you and God, and therefore a burning desire for reconciliation between you and the person who has done harm. In other words, we can put it in a simple phrase— The motivating force behind forgiveness must be a violent hatred of evil. Only the energy of hatred can propel you on the journey of forgiveness. When you hate evil, then you will likewise hate all things that divide and damage, all things that work against restoration and honest relationship. This is especially important in sustaining the desire to forgive when the one who harmed you isn't repentant or isn't even interested in true reconciliation. So this is a good place to return to the story of Peter and Jesus. How does the story unfold? How does the confrontation with Peter unfold? What happens precisely because Jesus refused to forgive and forget, but instead looked at Peter? And named. And what happens is that Peter is cut to the heart about what he has done, and he goes outside and he weeps bitterly. But that is not the end of the story. After Jesus' resurrection, he and Peter have a very intense and quite lovely conversation. It is a forgive and remember kind of conversation. And in the conversation, Jesus appoints Peter to be a shepherd to the people of God, to the earliest Christians, here's the point. Forgive and forget precludes the possibility of repentance, and therefore it precludes the possibility of redemption. But if you are willing to forgive and remember, then it leaves open the possibility of redemption. There might be a moment in which your eyes meet the eyes of your betrayer and they are cut to the heart like Peter and they weep for how they have harmed you. But that moment can never come if you forgive and forget, which is not forgiveness at all. If you forgive and remember, then there is the possibility that your offender may be willing to receive the pearl of you naming how they have harmed you, which opens the possibility for true repentance and therefore for redemption. We can put it this way. Forgive and remember makes redemption possible, which means that evil does not win.
This whole discussion about forgiveness, it has to be heard under the category of how much do you hate evil? It has to be heard under the umbrella heading. Forgiveness is under the umbrella heading of how much do you hate evil? Forgive and forget allows evil to run rampant. I mean, absolutely rampant, unchecked. Forgive and remember creates the possibility for true repentance and redemption, which is another way of saying the reversal of what evil intended. So your understanding of forgiveness is as simple as how much hatred do you have in your heart? How much hatred of evil? How committed are you to undoing the work of evil in this world? Okay, element number three. The third part involved in the process of forgiving someone is to continually attend to the posture of your heart toward the person who has hurt you. And what do I mean by the posture of your heart? Well, your posture can be one of contempt or it can be one of longing for the other person's repentance and imagining them owning their sin and confessing it to you and weeping over how they have harmed you. Two very different postures. Forgiveness is a refusal to make the other person pay. It is a refusal to have a posture of contempt and a posture of condemnation for the person who hurt you. This is the costly part of forgiveness. In forgiveness, you are, in essence, canceling the debt that is owed to you. Canceling the debt debt simply means I will continue to engage you without you owing me anything. But here's the thing. You can't cancel the debt until you have faced the size of the debt itself. I mean, that's just axiomatic. You can't cancel the debt until you have named and seen the cost of the full weight of the harm done to you. Here's how Dan Allender puts it. He says, you have to enter into your own heartache for the wound that was caused, and you have to enter into your own anger for the wound that was caused. Dan Allender, enter in your own heartache and enter into your own anger. Most of us have very little interest in really sitting with and owning the significance and the scope of the debt that the harm did. We don't want to sit in the heartache and the anger that result from acknowledging internally, just in our own hearts, the harm done to us. If you can't honestly name the horror of what has happened to you, it is going to be impossible to forgive. But let's be clear, what's blocking you is not a spirit of unforgiveness, not in this case. It's not hard-heartedness. It's not bitterness. It's that you don't want to feel the searing pain of the wound inflicted upon you. And you can't possibly forgive your offender until you feel the full weight of the harm that was done. So a simple summary sentence, forgiveness is costly. Okay, if forgiveness is so costly, why is it a good idea? Why is it a good idea to forgive? Well, a lot of reasons, but one of them is that it is far, far more costly not to forgive. When you refuse to forgive your offender, your heart will become hard and cold. A common alternative to forgiveness is to attempt to cut the offender out of your life, out of your awareness. It's more than just not talking to them. You don't want to think about them. You don't want to think about what they did to you. And so the alternative to forgiveness is essentially to cut them off from humanity. But if you do this, You have turned your heart away from desire and you have therefore cut yourself off from your own humanity. It's this posture of they don't even matter to me. I don't care about them. Forget them. I don't care about them. I don't care where they are. They don't matter to me. What they did doesn't matter to me. Forget about it. This posture of I don't even care about them, it's actually an attempt 
to numb your desires. To numb your desire for the offender to own up to the harm that they've done. To numb your desire to hurt the other person. Your desire for vengeance. Your desire for reconciliation. Whatever combination of desires you have with regard to this person who has hurt you. The posture of, I don't care about them. It doesn't matter what they did. It's in the past. I'm not going to address it. All of that is so often an attempt to deaden the desires that are actually in your heart. And when you begin to shut down these desires, the desire for the offender to own up to the harm they've done, desire for vengeance, desire for reconciliation, whatever combination of desires you have, when you begin to shut them down, your heart is beginning to harden. And whenever you do that, you become someone who is less human Someone who is controlled by the harm done against you. A heart to forgive is a heart that desires to do good. That moves into the heart of another to do good, to name truth, to invite repentance. Here is how Pastor Tim Keller puts it. He's a pastor in New York City. And he says, many people would say that forgiveness feels like a kind of death. Yes, but it is a death that leads to resurrection instead of the lifelong death of bitterness and cynicism. Forgiveness means bearing the cost instead of making the wrongdoer bear it so you can reach out in love to seek your enemy's renewal and change. Uh, Tim Keller Do you hear desire in that sentence? What he's inviting you to is a longing for your enemy to be changed. So element number three of the process of forgiveness is continually refocusing the posture of your heart toward the other person. Element number four uh, is it's simply repeat, repeat. Keep on doing one, two, and three. The point, and the reason I've, I've, I've put this out as a separate element, the point is that forgiveness is a process. It is a process. Here's how Dan, Dan Allender puts it. I, I love this. Forgiveness is not a snapshot, he says. It's not a photograph. It's a movie. It's not a mere event. Let me, let me read a paragraph from Christian neuroscientist Kurt Thompson. Uh, he, he gets at this so well. I'll read it and then, and then I'll unpack it. Here's how Kurt Thompson puts it. So often, the very idea of forgiveness is reduced to something we practice as a brief, abstract mental function. A two and a half second sweep of our mind in which we think or utter the words, I forgive you. He continues, we frame forgiveness as something that consists of a single act That happens in a finite and brief period of time. Once it's done, it's done. From the perspective of memory and emotion, much of this is our attempt to reduce the felt pain of the wound we have sustained. It is an attempt to avoid the emotional distress that remembering fosters. Kurt Thompson. I love how he says... (laughs) That forgiveness is not a two and a half second mental act in which we say to ourselves, I forgive my father for hurting me. That's not it. Why? Because that's cheap. It's cheap. You know it's cheap. It doesn't honor the severity of the wound. It doesn't even honor living in the light of truth. Here's here's the other part that Kurt Thompson is saying. He's saying that forgiveness is not a single act that happens in a moment of time. Forgiveness is a process. In other words, you can't forgive someone and then it's over. Third, Kurt Thompson is saying that the reason that we are attracted to a, to a two and a half second, I forgive my father for hurting me, is because two and a half second forgiveness allows us to avoid the pain of remembering. As Robin said last week, if we are not called to forgive and forget, what are we called to? To forgive and remember. 
There can be neither forgiveness nor reconciliation without remembering. Now, I want to talk about one more reason that forgiveness can never be a one-time event. Whatever act of harm you are forgiving, it is likely that you are going to understand more about that harm next year than you do right now. And so you're going to have something else to forgive. I mean, as you continue to engage your story, you are going to come to realize that those sexually suggestive comments that your dad made when you were 14 years old were actually far more damaging and dark than you realized. They have tentacles that extend into more areas of your life and that, and you're going to realize that they have wreaked havoc in your relationships, in your sexuality, that they weren't no big deal, that it wasn't just dad being dad. You're going to name with much more clarity the harm that was done in your past the more and more you mature, the more and more that the Spirit of God reveals to you what has been true of your life. The more you engage your story, the more you will understand the harm done to you, and therefore, the more you will be called to forgive. You will be called to forgive more next year than you are this year. You never stop forgiving. Forgiveness is never past tense. Why? Because I know more about the ways my parents sinned against me now than I knew even a couple of years ago. So I had forgiven them for many things, but now there are new levels of forgiveness that are required. The Spirit of God is inviting me to new levels of forgiveness as the Spirit of God reveals new levels of harm. Let's address some common questions that often come up when we engage this subject of forgiveness. Just as we end, let me just address some common questions. Number one, if I truly forgive someone, does that mean that I won't hurt anymore? Of course not. If it's been five years and you don't hurt anymore, then you have lost compassion for yourself and others. Number two, if I truly forgive someone, does that mean that I won't be angry anymore? I sure hope not. I hope not. The desire for revenge is not all bad. Part of what, part, please hear this, part of what's driving your desire for revenge is actually quite holy because it grows out of a good longing for justice. So depending on the severity of the harm and depending on whether or not there has been repentance on the part of the other, anger can be quite holy. If the other person has not repented and you have lost all sense of anger then your once hot desire for justice has cooled off. And in that sense, you have lost your connection to God's passion for justice and righteousness. Please hear the implication. Much of what is considered godly in our modern churches couldn't be further from it. If you've lost anger in the name of forgiveness, then you've lost a heart for justice. Other Christians may extol you for this, but it's actually quite tragic. And it's evidence not of your holiness, but of your ability to deaden your heart and to disconnect from what is actually quite glorious about you. Two final comments. Number one, what I have just uh, outlined is nothing close to an exhaustive treatment of the subject of forgiveness. There is so much more to say. Uh, than can be said right now. And number two, this episode is not about reconciliation. Reconciliation is another topic. There can be no reconciliation without a heart to forgive. Without a heart to forgive, there can't be reconciliation. However, there can absolutely be forgiveness without reconciliation. In fact, here's how Dan Allender puts it. Forgiveness may bring peace, but it may bring more war. Forgiveness may bring peace, but it may bring more war. That's up to the other person. Whether it brings peace or war is up to the other person, but that's another podcast episode. 
if you want to understand how to engage, how to engage with those who have harmed you, which is not what I'm talking about right now. If you are wanting more about that, I recommend uh, taking a look at the last three chapters of a book called Bold Love by Dan Allender and Tremper Longman. They dive into this whole subject of how do we engage with, how do we relate to uh, people who have harmed us, uh, depending on where that person is in the process of owning the harm and repenting. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. And thank you so much to Rick Wilson and Rob Mathis for the intro and outro music. Merry Christmas, everybody. 